Hi everybody, we're back here on the virtual chair um, for our, the fourth in what's turned out to be an incredible little series of lovely conversations and a great way to um, get these sometimes very long days in. Um, tonight we have somebody who I've known, I mean like everybody else, I've known for a very, very long time. And for me, uh, probably the closest friend I've had in this industry probably forever. Uh, Pamela Smith it is probably synonymous with um, makeup in Ireland and beyond. She's one of the the, the absolute geniuses of behind the, the behind the film screen, behind the the, 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 ca the camera. And for me, she's also an incredibly easygoing, enlightening, innovative individual who is so easy to work with and so um, brilliant at what she does that actually, uh, when I'm working with her, it never feels like work. We started out many, many years ago um, uh, when, when we were um, wor working with Jim Crone, the photographer. And I could, the thing I remember most about him is that he just laughed so much. The whole shoot was just spent with us, um, just literally having a great time and um, laughing and giggling all the way through. I mean, if I sound a little bit kind of bumbly today, it's because I'm just thinking of some of the mad things and the crazy things we used to do. So um, it's incredible now that we've just had the opportunity to catch up. Our lives have changed dramatically. There she is. Hi, yes. Pamela. How are you doing? I was given, I was trying to give a bit of an introduction into our lives um, because we've known each other for such a long time. Sorry. Okay. Great stuff. Do you want to just adjust your camera so I can see your face? Pamela, yeah, you, you look great. I don't know. Can I turn it that way? Uh, no, because it looks like you're horizontal. Okay. Yeah, that's better. We can see you now. Okay, I'll have Fantastic. to hold it. Okay. Can you not get somebody to hold it for you? What are them two sons of yours doing? Yeah, I'll have to hold it. <laughs> Would you... <I've> got to... <laughs> so, yeah. You can tell from Pamela that this is absolutely brand new. You never do this sort of stuff. No. <laughs> no. This so is you're... first... This is the first time ever that I have done anything like this. I have no idea what's going on. Lex had oh. to set push buttons and I, I had to think about, uh, how to, I don't know, I'm lost anyway. Okay, well this is what you're, you're just going to sit there and we're going to chat, okay? All right, All right. do you have a nice drink? Do you have a gin and tonic, a glass of wine? Gin. Got my gin. Okay, fantastic. So Pamela, when I think back to when we both started out back in the um, 1600s, I think it was, um, when the dinosaurs walked the earth, you and I literally were just doing this for kicks. We were doing it for fun. We never ever really thought that, you know, this was what would happen, that this would be a career path. I suppose both of us probably felt we'd do this job, but the reality of it was, you know, we never thought too much further uh, ahead. No, I, I mean, I think... I don't think we thought about it as a a career or anything like that in mm. the sense that it was, uh, this is the step one of the future. It was mm. more a case of, fuck, this is great crack. Can we do it next week? Mm -hmm. Do you know, it wasn't, right, a, yeah. it, it wasn't ever, a, a, this is step one. Mm. That it, it is what it is. And it was what it was on the day. It, it never felt like the beginning of anything. It was just always really great, great crack. Yeah. So I, have to and I, always, I think that I always remember about those days is we were so disorganized. We literally would turn up. I mean, nowadays it's all mood boards, organization, planning, yeah. meetings about meetings. But we literally just turned up and knocked out some hair and makeup. And Jim yeah. Crone spot it. I have to say, it's, that is a time that I miss because um, now in film and fashion, I suppose, you, you have to arrange what it is you're doing and talk about the theme. And there is just too many meetings now. Mm. And there's too many people as well taking, saying, oh, I don't really like that. And can I have a little bit of this? And can you, you know, there's just too much involved. Whereas That's as an artist, you actually just want to do the thing. So I, it's actually one of the things that I don't like about the, any type of industry um connection to what it is we do 
on an art level, uh, it, it just, I find it really frustrating listening to other people's um, opinions on what it is we, we are doing, <laughs> you know, I, and I, it just doesn't, I, I can't do it. It's another reason why I always find it really difficult to do, for want of a better word, normal people. You know, because mm. someone would say to me, um, I, can I have this and can I have that? And I would be working away and thinking, that's it, you look flipping amazing. And they would go, yeah, but can I, can I not have more blush? And I'm, mm. I'm going, no, because <laughs> I think what, you ha what, what it, that is, is absolutely perfect. And you mm. can have something different, but if I did more blush, it wouldn't be the same look anymore and then I wouldn't like it. So I, I'm kind of... I've ended up being lucky to do stuff that um, means that I am the designer, so I can I can do it, and hopefully then people look and nod and go, yeah, that's great, thanks very <laughs> thanks very much. I you know, the thing that when I was talking to you earlier today, I, I've been thinking about you know the last thirty five years, and you and I have so much in common. We we are so alike in lots of ways. I mean, obviously from the first day. <laughs> Of the city, yeah, yeah. I'm from West Belfast. You're from East Belfast. We both thought Hollywood was a place where rich people lived when you were taking a day trip to Hulk, to Bangor. That's um, it. And and actually, and we we both felt very lucky along the way that we were doing something we loved. Now I'm going to take you back to the 1970s, early 80s. There were no freelance makeup artists. Makeup artists were girls who worked in Anderson Macaulay or Boots and did make up for weddings or when they were called for, but they didn't do it as a career. Now you actually were the very first freelance makeup artist in Northern Ireland. True. For, yes, yeah, freelance. There was a couple yeah. of people worked in UTV and a couple of people worked in the BBC as permanent jobs and they did the news on an everyday basis and they also did drama, which I mm. thought was just a fantastic word, you know. And <laughs> Whenever I was 18, 19, I'd be thinking, geez, imagine doing drama. You know, it always sounded uh, like a fantastic thing to do. But then once I did do uh, some days, um, it kind of was a little bit dull at the very beginning. And I was glad of the fashion work and, you know, doing all the editorials and all your hair shoots and everything, because they were, they were just fun and creative. There was, th that was it, full stop. So... Then that was the sort of the TV that paid the money. Um, and I, I suppose because I had started off doing the fashion, it meant that uh, I was available. And the first commercial I ever did was with a, a, um, a model who I had worked with. We'd both got our hair done by probably Alan Boyce in, you know, you were doing your bit. And then... Um, the following week, she said to me, look, I'm doing this commercial. Do you fancy coming in and doing my makeup for it? And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds good fun. And it was at that point that I realized this is an actual job. Someone's paying me to come here today and make sure she looks good. Mm -hmm. And up until that, the only option was, as you say, to work on a, on a beauty counter, which was sales related and I couldn't sell anything. Um, and or in the TV studio where you would have had to have, you know, uh, the right criteria to, to get into that industry. And it was so it was so specialized. There only was a couple of jobs in each one. So um, I think I was really, really lucky with that one introduction. And from that step on, I had other people then saying, would you come and do my makeup or we're doing another shoot next week? Will you come and, and do it? And it was then I thought, you know what, this is actually brilliant. And I got a little grant from the government. Um, I, I can't I think it was something, it was a, like 400 quid or something at the time. It was a set up startup grant. And I went to the bank and put it in and immediately spent the entire money on makeup. And I had my little bag and then that was, that was me. It was only whenever we were doing it a few years that I actually realized that I had to do more drinking. <laughs> than just doing what came naturally as far as beauty was concerned. I had to actually do some training, which was a whole other... You, you, you started out as a... We, we, you, we used to use you as a hair model, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. From about 15... Yeah. 
Yeah, 15. Um, it was even just before Alan Boyce, actually. I think I used to do things for, um, you know, at that point, probably Tony and Guy was around. There was a couple of big salons in Manchester and London that came here to do in the old Drum King Hotel and they'd do hair shows and I would have like red haired Mohicans. I'm fortunate enough to have the hair that pretty much do anything with it. And mm -hmm. I was up for, you, you could cut it, dye it, style it, tongue it, stick it, glue it, perm it, do whatever you wanted. And it did what, whatever they did with it, it stayed. Um, so I, I got quite a wee, a wee go out of that. <laughs> and, then, um, and then obviously moved, moved across the makeup end of it. So moving a little bit further ahead, when things started to move along here and, you know, there was an, enough work for both makeup artists and hairdressers and shoots and magazines, things like Northern Woman and a lot of magazines were starting to open up. I mean, you were doing, all, you were doing nearly all the work, but was it paying? Was there money in it? Um, the fashion end of it, no. Um, you would have just got enough money to pay for your expenses for the day. I, I, as far as I can remember, uh, it would have been equivalent to, say, in today's money, probably 50 quid a day, uh, mm -hmm. which covered just your makeup and your expenses and whatever. But it was the commercials. 80s was massive and early 90s was massive in Northern Ireland for commercials and advertising. We j Massive. And for six, six, seven years, it was working every single week on commercial something or other, whether it was the, you know, front cover for a packet of tights through to an ad for Stuart supermarkets. Uh, you know, it was just one ad after another. And it was the advertising that I made enough money to actually call it a career at that point. Um, it was only whenever I moved into film and realised that you could you could have a, a chunk of money for two or three months' work rather than two or three days that I thought, actually, you know, this is incredible. Somebody's actually paying me as if a normal job. But you actually were involved in film way before the Northern Ireland film explosion. I remember you were working down south, working a lot away from Belfast before things really kicked off here. How did that happen? How did you, how did you manage to get, get your footprint into global film before the, the, obviously the Game of Thrones and stuff happened here? Well, it, I, it was probably in my late twenties. Um, there was a producer, Daryl Collins, who I'd worked with um, many years ago. Uh, he was a commercials uh, producer and he said he was making a low budget film in County Cavan, a uh, Cahill Black film and um would i like to come and do it and he said look there's no money in it uh it'll be great crack which is what all producers say and um <laughs> i had to go along and uh see what it was like and at that point i i just had it was literally thrown in at the deep end so i i got sent a script and i read it and did a very natural breakdown on it and it's funny it's the same type of breakdown that I still do today um, on, a, on a job. So I read the script and thought, this is all very doable. I'll need a couple of uh, extra pair of hands and uh, to help me with it. And I, then at that point, um, I, I really needed to sort of, it, because it was set in the 50s, I had to get you, you'd already taught me to do basic hair cutting at that point, but not the clippers. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to do a, a crash course in clipper cutting um, because of the time period and uh, you know it, it, to this day I, I just think how on earth I, I managed that and it looked fantastic and it was a great film to work on um, and it was uh, Andrew Scott who everybody oh, yeah. knows now it was his first film and he was I think he was 17 so wow. uh, yeah so the two of us had a great great crack on that on that job and then of course I met Mark um, on that job as well and Mark my husband as you know he uh, was uh, living in Dublin and pretty much straight out of college there but ha having done film studies and he had said to me you know you should come to Dublin there's lots of work down there and that was it pretty much I spent a lot of time in Dublin and then meeting 
several producers. Then I got some other work um, abroad. I did some fashion-y stuff away um, for magazines and things like that, different countries and whatever. So, um, yeah, I've, I've got to travel a fair bit. Obviously, well, I'm going to wind you back a little bit there because, you, you know, you tend to sort of talk about these things in a very throwaway um, manner as if, you know, yeah, this just happened. But actually, the thing I remember about you at the time, Pamela, is you were working so hard. You did anything and everything. Well, you, you chose your projects, but you were working all the time. And you never once turned me down. I would say, listen, I need you to do a L'Oreal Colour Trophy. I need you to do a British Hairdressing Awards. And you would say, well, what weekend is it going to be? And I'd say, it's going to be the weekend of the 12th of March. And you would say, can you do it the following weekend? Because I'll be free. That's how we, you always managed to get us. So you kept your hand in doing hair and beauty and fashion for a period of time. But yeah. you never said, was there a time where you just got burnt out? Was there a time where it was like, this is enough? Um, probably about season three of Game of Thrones, which not at that, way back then I had the energy. You're in your 20s, your 30s. Um, working, you know, on film, as you know, you could be doing six, seven days a week and 14 hours a day. And uh, when you're young in 20s, 30s, whatever, it's not a bother. When I get into my early 40s, um, I kind of started to find it a little bit harder with the hours. Um, mm. And at one point, I think um, it was probably season, I think it was season two or season three, season three, on Game of Thrones that I had set up the school. So I was working, say, for example, six months in Game of Thrones doing two units. And then I would come back and start teaching the following Monday and teach for six weeks and then have maybe a week off at Christmas and then do like the fall for 12, 14 weeks and then do another six weeks of teaching and then back to the next season of Thrones. Now, on top of all that, doing, um, you know, your 70, 80 hour weeks, on top of all that, I had two very young children. Um, back then, they w season three, they would have been around um, five, six, seven kind of age. And trying to logistically organize two children and their pickups. And thankfully, I had my mum and dad and they did all the school runs and you know, uh, they would keep all of that home life going. Um, I had a live-in nanny all of the time. Uh, and I also then was designing, as you know, doing houses. So that was a big side kick for me. And I would, I would spend any spare minute. And now when I look back on that time, um, it actually amazes me how, how I'm, you know, how I managed. A lot of people would be like, I don't know how you do it. And I'd be thinking, well, you just do. And it's only now I go, geez, I don't know how you do that. I would even say that to other people now, you know. You, you don't I mean, I, I do, know, but I remember, I remember on the rare occasion that we got the chance to meet up. I mean, you literally had four or five jobs and a project and the kids. Um, and we thought we were running a very stressful business, but you were literally doing everything. But let's go back a little bit to when things really blew up open in Northern Ireland. I mean, obviously you were at the top of your game and all of a sudden you had Netflix and, and uh, Hollywood was literally going to be parked on our doorstep. Did they come to you right away? Did they know about you and they said, hey, we want you to do this job? Or was it something you had to pitch for? Well, you normally have to pitch for everything. Someone comes to you because they, a producer will come to Northern Ireland and not know anyone. And we have a great um, film commission. It used to be called the Film Commission, it's now NI Screen. And it, it's a body that uh, aids productions coming in massively. So they, they cover, you know, uh, grants to help them. They show them locations. They give them lists of crews. They tell them the, what's the easy logistics and how to move about, etc. So the NI Screen has a list of people and they hand that over to the producer and the producer calls maybe three or four of us and we all go and meet a producer or a director. And so you, you do have to kind of pitch in that sense, but I'm, we're very lucky that we have a, a, a base of information so that if any production, no matter if they've never set foot in Northern Ireland before, when they come here, 
they have a, a key point to start with and mm. they then guide them to uh, who's out there, where's good to film and what grants are available from local government, etc. And um, it's at that point then that I have to go on and pitch. Usually I'd meet the director. Um, if it's if it's film, it would be director. If it's TV, it would be producers normally. And you have to actually then uh, read the script and uh, go and meet them and see see what you can do for them and if, if they like you or um, if it's all going to work out, you know. So it, it, it's a... It, it's it's like going for an interview um, for a job for pretty much everything that you do. So in the last 20 years, you have created literally an army of makeup artists. You, there's, I mean, it's a battalion of people um, who, you know, seem to be at your beck and call. They literally, you, you, you know, click your fingers and these brilliant people come out of the woodwork. I've worked with some of them and you've yeah. trained them to, um, to a very high standard on a very high level. And, and it seems to me that no matter how many come along, more come along. I mean, how many makeup artists do you need? Well, we, we needed an awful lot for Thrones. That was the, that was the kickoff. The, the year before Thrones came in, um, we had a film called Your Highness. And it was at that point that we had uh, a scene with a wedding in it with uh, James Franco and uh, Zoe Deschanel. And, um, the wedding was period, uh, medieval, and I could not get enough makeup people at all. And we had a lot of girls at that point who could do like pretty makeup, which mm -hmm. was great for a wedding. Um, but n very few of them could do period hair or for some of the men in, in the scenes had beards and they didn't know how to trim a beard. They didn't know how to fill in if, if it was patchy. Uh, then we had peasant scenes and nobody knew how to do dirt and you know there was, whatever it was um, we just didn't have enough people so whenever Game of Thrones happened it was pretty much the same year we did the pilot 2009 and then season one was 2010 and I knew between 2009 and 2010 I would have to actually set up some kind of um, education for um the real basics over mm -hmm. and beyond the normal makeup um because in my kit i have a little amount of cosmetics and my brushes and my tools but then i have all these specialist things that uh that no other fashion or beauty makeup artist would have in their kit um and i was fluent with them but they weren't so it was i didn't have the time to teach them on set and I needed people that I could call that were reliable and that would show up. And I, that's why I opened the makeup department, the school, because I needed to get some people in. And I knew that I needed to do intensive classes that were only a week long and do several weeks, one on facial hair, one on wigs, one on whatever, uh, special effects, one on prosthetics and just knock them out and try and get as many people. Now, we had eight people in a class and two of them maybe wouldn't be great. And then mm. six of them would be all right. And then when you rang them, they weren't available. And then you were down to four. And then somebody let, didn't get up on time one morning or they were late and couldn't really <laughs> be bothered and changed their mind. They were getting a carpet delivered and couldn't get out of bed, whatever. Um, so then we only had two people so then the next year we had another in batch of uh, students. So we always gained some, lost some, some didn't work out. They had all the boxes ticked and then they, they did something stupid, uh, which meant that I couldn't use them again. Um, and well, what did they do? Did they, did they take somebody's eyebrows off? What would they do? No, it would be things like uh, you, you would be, I call my my team little ninjas. You know, they all wear black. They all sort of hide in the in the crevices around the film set. <laughs> and whenever they say checks, they nip in, do whatever they have to do, and nip out again. And nobody sees them. And nobody, you know, there's to me, there's nothing worse than being all about you. So mm -hmm. anybody who comes in as a makeup artist and then goes up and does the lipstick and makes sure that everybody sees them doing the lippy and has a laugh with the director on the way past. And I'm looking going off the set. So um, 
you would be amazed at how many people wanted to be makeup artists just just to be on the film set, not to actually do the work. So, well, uh, I want to come to that because I think that's a really interesting thing. There's two things I really want to speak to you about tonight, Pamela. The one thing is the difference between, I mean, there probably are in Northern Ireland 20 million MUAs, right? Maybe 10 million. Yeah. Well, the, the MUA, we, we, don't, we don't use the word M MUA. The, the knew, word I the knew letters, that would have been. Yeah. The letters MUA is a made up thing for people who do uh, beauty makeup. Okay. Actual makeup artists that work in reality, in film or TV as a career, we none of us call ourselves MUAs. We're all makeup artists or makeup designers or makeup supervisors or hair hair artists or you know yeah the word MEA does not exist in our terminology at all okay i see i touched a nerve there <laughs> i un <laughs> i understand i get the MEA thing let's move on so um, but what makes the difference between somebody who is a makeup artist and can do makeup and somebody who can who can work on film as one of your protégés or team? What's the difference? Well, it's being able to do more than one thing. So if you, if you go onto Instagram or Facebook or any of the things and type in any MUA for whatever, um, most, I would say 99 out of your 100 people that are out there that are doing that kind of makeup, it's all, it's like uh, paint by numbers. It's all very formulaic. Everybody has the same eyebrows, the same shape of eyes. It's all very Kardashian. Um, you, you'll maybe get the odd one who does something slightly different or maybe just changes the color, but does exactly the same thing on mm -hmm. everybody. And the way that I look at it is that that particular look is just one character. So okay. in film, we have hundreds of characters. And you may not even get that pretty 20 something going out to a nightclub. I, I can't remember the last time I actually had to do that kind of makeup. What mm -hmm. we do is make people look uh, real, tired, ill, dead, um, d you know, distraught, sweaty, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you have to be able to do everything. And the, it, to, the way that I always used to say it was like, uh, um, what if you equate it to working in a bank, for example, we work in all currency and um, we can do foreign currency, direct debits, checks, online drafts, la 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 la, whereas MEAs work with five Ps. Okay, <laughs> brilliant. All right, so how, how often and can people make the transfer from being a traditional makeup artist working in, you know, weddings, fashion, doing yeah. their things, to being an on-set makeup artist? That's my main, main question. Okay, you have to just widen your eyes. It's, okay. you know, the, and even at that, like the, uh, what I, what I used to upset me were people who would be very sort of, um, what's the word? Uh, they would be very defensive you know, they would mm. say, but I've been a makeup artist for 10 years or I'm a fully trained this or I'm a fully trained that. And I'd be thinking, actually, you're not. And if you took that attitude away and mm. said, I really, really like to get into business or your whatever line you do, what what is it that I need to learn? Um, I, I, I was there with open arms. Yep, I'll come and I'll teach you everything. And everyone mm. who came through the school pretty much got everything that I knew. I didn't keep secrets. I didn't say, um, I'll only teach you this bit and I'll keep that wee bit to myself. I wanted all of those people out there to know as much as they, they could so that mm. they could actually work with me and not against me, but with me. So um, that, that's why we had the school uh, with that sort of attitude of, if you want to learn to do beauty makeup, you go and learn, you know, you can pick up millions of tips on YouTube of how to do the exact same eyeshadow that's in fashion at the moment. Mm. But could you dissect a look from 1830 
in, uh, in central Paris and work out exactly what lip color she would have worn of that time to do with her class and what was available to her, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or could you um, make that guy look like he's been living in a cave for a year and do all the layering of dirt and facial hair and fatigue and stress and you know it's a it's a really big big uh, world yeah. makeup and hair is a big world and um it encompasses a lot so there's a lot of training and you know a lot of the girls who had come through the school did you know way more than maybe three four six classes plus mm. then they had to actually then get out onto set and get experience that way Okay. So by the end of Thrones, we had a we had a, a team to work on two units, maybe around between hair and makeup, probably around 50, 45, 50 people um, oh. that were all fantastic. Um, mm. But not all of them were available all the time. So even within mm. that, there'll be a, there would have been hairdressers that had their clients at the weekend that we didn't take them away from. Um, but they were further down our list. And then there were people that were up the list that were available 100%, you know, um, and they're the ones that will then carry on through now. Uh, we still have filming, Game of Thrones has ended. We don't have the same um, need to teach anymore, which I don't teach anymore. Um, and uh, you, my son's just flicked on his... Uh, thing he was bored um so <laughs> he's on his thing going Whoa. um so we don't we don't have the same need now to train people from scratch but we are still training people in expanding what they already know so even if you've been in the available and doing makeup for maybe three four years on set and maybe prior to that another six years then you may never have done a bald cap or you may never have actually put on uh, lay on individual facial hair. And it's a, it's something that's in your head. You think I'd really like to learn that at this yeah. point though, I'll only teach people out of the girls that are now in my, uh, my team for want of a better word They're We're all freelance. So I don't actually, I don't employ them. We're all the same. We're all looking for the same jobs. Um, those girls now are all, to the point where if they want to learn something, they ask me or they ask their peer and they're all starting to swap information now. I, I, my job's done. So um, the school, uh, you know, I think after Thrones and looking at what's coming up in the near future, I think we're, we're good for, um, for people, you know, for the next few years anyway, there's, we could do with more trainees We've got lots mm. of assistants and artists in different levels, but we're always sort of short of actually brand new people that and I'm happy to have brand new people that are have no experience at all rather mm. than um, someone who I then have to reshape or or take take the modern eyebrows off their repertoire, you know. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I mean, I know exactly where you come from because we're the same here, doesn't now, one of the other things, Pamela, that you and I talk about all the time is every time I'm speaking to you, you're talking about courses and training. And in 1993, 94, you came in to me to see me in the salon and said, I want you to teach me how to cut hair. You'd seen way before anybody else that you that being a, being a makeup artist wasn't going to cut it on its own. And you yeah. did this before anybody. I remember very distinctly. And I remember saying, well, I'll always be here. I can always come and do the hair. Yeah. And you said, yeah, but it is going to change. People are going to have to be hair and makeup. You have yeah. a salon call, but I need to learn how to do this. And I said, well, what do you need to learn? And you wanted to learn haircuts. And they weren't just throwaway haircuts. They were technical haircuts. You wanted to know the absolute foundation of what makes hair move, how it fits on faces, yeah. how it fits on heads. Yeah. Talk to me about that. I mean... What, where did you get that insight that you thought that was something you needed to do? Well, before 94, before I came to you with that, um, I had been doing a lot of hair styling. So mm. to me, from there up was the whole look. 
So I would have been doing hair and makeup for, say, TV commercial. And, you know, you, because I'm a girl, I kind of feel that I had the advantage of being able to handle a hair dryer and a brush. And I played like I did with a, as a child. Um, so when I, to me, when I see a hair uh, and a face, I, I start, it's like, it's like sculpting. So I start work and I, as I'm doing it, I know when I need to add a little bit more, take a bit away in terms of makeup. And in terms of hair, I, I would have been say doing a period thing and I'll work out how the hair should go. And I'd be pulling my fingers through it and going, now I want it to be flat here, a bit of height here, but then I wanted to come around the front or whatever I wanted to do with it. And it was at that point I realized that I actually needed to cut it as well because mm -hmm. the length of the hair of the person would come in, say they had hair all down the one length and I would be brushing it and styling it and I would be cheating by putting pins in to make it look like it was shorter in certain areas or um, I we had quite a bit of ex uh, experience for things like matching a stunt double with a, an actual, an actor. So the mm. actor would be cast and if you didn't have a wig, the guy would show up and you would then have to try and curl his hair and flatten it and squidge it in and make it look uh, as close to the actor as possible. And then I realized that I actually needed to be able to cut <laughs> it as well. So um, technically speaking, um, you teaching me the the cuts, the, the actual basic fundamental cuts was fantastic. But then I have to go in and adapt it to a different mm -hmm. time period because obviously what you do today is, you know, for today and it's for clients and it's for someone, it's for an individual. So every time you do a hair, you're talking to the individual about what they want and what they're going to go home with and they have to be happy with. I couldn't do that. So what I'm looking at is... Uh, how do I make their hair do what I want them to, want it to do? And, mm. you know, I'm trying to cut it bearing in mind that they have a normal life, mm -hmm. but also that I have to make it work for the, the film. So there would be a wee bit, I would be a wee bit more off piste than, uh, I don't think I could work in a salon um, because I'd probably get told off. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I, might, I think you probably could, but... <laughs> It, it's a different discipline, of course. It's, it's, it is very different. It is very yeah. different. But I do yeah. enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that, you know, obviously now um, when you're building your teams, you, you do have people who have hair experience and have um, and makeup experience. But back then, that made you quite unique because not only could you bring hair styling to the game, you actually could cut hair. And you could cut hair. I mean, I know you could cut hair well. It wasn't just a case of, I mean, I'm not sure how you how good you were at knocking out a few restyles on a Saturday afternoon, but no. you certainly got her to a level that was competent and authentic, which is important. But all your team seemed to be able to do that. Do you now teach them hair as well as makeup? Um, well, we have, uh, we did have wig courses. Um, Natalie Reed uh, would have been the specialist at the wigs and um, having worked on West End uh, shows for, for years and massive period films. So um, she would have been our tutor for uh, period hair. And then, of course, we got you or Jimmy Beach in to do cutting and, and styling. But a lot of the girls now in between that are going and doing sort of their NBQ2 just mm -hmm. to be able to do hair every day. Uh, whereas in film, you know, I, I might cut somebody's hair in the morning and then not cut their hair again for maybe nine or 10 days whenever it needs back to continuity. And, and then the next day I'm fitting a new actor. So I'll give them an, a haircut. If it was somebody who was very, very specific and I had a big team, a big cast, I, I wouldn't do their hair at all. I would get somebody else who was really good at hair in and they would do mm. that. Equally, I might do some uh, somebody's hair and makeup and then someone else would do their prosthetics or I would do their prosthetics. or And a lot of that would depend on the cast member as well as the script. 
So some cast members, you know, there are people that I've worked with that are you are effectively their personal. Um, yeah. And if it's a collaboration, um, say you're working on something that has a, a, a team of people and a cast of maybe 60, uh, you might only do the leading actor and your team will do everybody else. Or you will a assign uh, one of your team to the leading actor and then you do everybody else as they're coming in. So, but that depends totally on the on the show. Um, so you have to, every single job is different where you have to adapt to suit the script and the cast and and everybody else that's coming in or out or, and also the pluses and minuses of um, the, the people that are in your team. Because there's sometimes I'll hire people that, uh, are fantastic at hair because that's predominant predominantly visual and creative within that shoot mm -hmm. or it might be um period where everybody looks the same or it could be uh, all about a mass murder in which case i'll i'll be right up there killing everybody <laughs> after I do you like the mass murders i pretty much like i like yeah, everything like as soon as you do something that's all death um by the end of it you just you're looking forward to some lipstick and then equally you do a job that everybody's pretty you know you start off a job and go yay i, I can do blow dries and i can do lipstick and then at the end of it you're just like no more lipstick and i want to kill people so um it, it's one of the massive pluses of the job is is the variety that it's not uh, a factory you're not just churning out the same thing every time Back in um, the late, about 2009, 2010, myself, Lisa, you and Mark went out for dinner and you were talking about this show that was about to be filmed in Belfast. Now, Northern Ireland was in the throes of recession. Sorry, I thought you were going to say something else there. What? I thought you were going to say something else there. Oh, no. Else. <laughs> I know that story. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't think we'll tell that story. Uh, so Lisa and I and you and Mark were having dinner and um, yeah, you started to talk about this show that was, um, that was about to be filmed in Belfast. And I remember Mark saying, it'll definitely get two series. And you went on to talk about, and I remember at the time thinking, do, do people really want to watch that crap? Is that, is that something? Now that crap ended up going on for most of our lives. It won you two Emmy Awards. And it's probably the single biggest cult following in modern television and cinematic history. Yep. And you were at the very, very beginning, centre and end of it. Yeah. Did you think at the beginning it was going to be as successful as it was? Um, yes, in the sense that it, 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 the individual um, show that you're working on is going to be great. Because that's by the time it comes to being filmed, it's already been around for a, a year, two years, four years, five years, whatever. So it has got funding. Mm -hmm. So at that point of making the, the, the show, it's already got the impetus to, to be at a point where it's, it's going to be good. Now, from the start of filming to it actually going on air, anything can happen. It could be um, badly acted, badly directed, badly shot not enough money, uh, disasters happen, whatever. Um, or it could have all the tech points and then when you watch it, it just doesn't have that thing that mm. makes it. Um, and what was that thing? I mean, what, what do you think it was? You, know, I mean, uh, it, you can't put it, it's, it's, you cannot actually put a, your finger on it. I've worked on things with amazing actors and you're looking at them on the set and then looking at the monitor and looking at the set and that person on the screen is not the person that you've been talking to all morning. For example, I worked years ago with an actor called Andy Circus, who, you know. Oh, yes, I know. Yes, I know Andy Circus. And um, I, I was watching him perform and thinking that is not the same person that I just did his makeup in the chair. He, he, mm. Whatever he did on screen set him apart from, you know. <laughs> I have to stop you. Someone's just asked, what is it? 
<laughs> in case anybody doesn't know, we're talking about Game of Thrones. Sorry, I just assumed everybody would know. I know. Um, yeah, Andy Serkis isn't in Game of Thrones. <laughs> no, somebody, somebody asked what we're talking about. Sorry, sorry about that. So yeah, so I I don't know what it is, mm. and it, there are some directors that are renowned for getting it, but obviously yeah. they're they're uh, they have an, an awful lot of money. Um, to, to back them now on things which helps um, and in, in the beginning Game of Thrones was a, a decent enough budget but as the years went on it just got bigger and bigger and you can see that as well in in everything in the set decoration in the costumes in the uh, in the CGI you mm. know the everything about it just got m more and more intense and uh, it just worked it just worked so well but being was part of that is incredible and was it as it got, as it became more and more successful? Was there more pressure? Was it more stressful, or did it become part of like? Were you just feeling? Did you feel like you're in Manchester United? It was just this huge, kind of powerful, very um, exciting team of people who were doing one very, thing. Very exciting team of people. Um, I, I it, every year you got the script and you you're reading a script that people would have died to have a look at yeah. so you know and it's you know you're turning the pages and going oh my god oh my god oh my god and then turning the pages turning the pages and you'd go you'd go to bed at night and close your eyes and just start visualizing that and because once you've got season one two as it goes on the characters are all established. So when you're reading the script, it's not my perception of the characters, uh, which it would normally be in a one-off film. You, you read a script and you have, you look at and think, right, that I figure that that guy has dark hair and he's tall and whatever. But it, it, once you've done a couple of series of things, um, the characters have a, a rhythm of their own. So as you're reading the script, you can see clearly how that's going to work. And that in itself is very, very exciting. Now, mm. once you get there, then it depends on the director because the director will, will shoot it in different angles. He will put emphasis on different parts. And what you see on the monitor then is, um, it, it could be different from what it is that you've read in, in the script. And that's where the magic comes in. You know, where you're standing maybe on a mountainside, you know, two in the morning and it's raining and you know, you've know you read the script and you know what's going to happen. And then the actor comes on and the director comes on and all of a sudden it has a, a whole other feel to it. Um, so that in itself is, is one of the, the most amazing things about working in film and TV is, is being involved in that amount of uh instant it's like a creation that's just happening in front of you i i can't so, describe well we know because you know anybody who's watched it and watched just the level and scale it got to could see how this thing that people probably dipped their toes into initially and then were absolutely hooked um but obviously the big thing for you was the global recognition you got for your part in it not once, but twice. How did, how did that, when you got the word that you were nominated, because Pamela, obviously, as one of your friends, we were so proud and excited. I remember thinking, Christ, this is, this is real shit. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm, as you know, I'm really not big into the big award thing. It kind mm -hmm. of freaks me out because I love, when, when you just do what you do, and then someone goes, yeah, you're great at it. You go, thanks very much. But somebody actually saying to me, like, it, I get the same buzz with having, having an extra come up to me and go, I thought that guy was actually had his head cut open there. I get the same buzz from somebody on set who I have no idea who they are telling me that that was brilliant and he thought that looked real as someone handing me a, a, a statue and saying, well done, you did a great job. It doesn't matter what form it comes in. It's mm. all good. But the, the big massive uh, award scenario thing is, I suppose it's great for recognition 
as you say, on a on a on a more sort of a, a larger scale, where you've it's nearly like a, a medal or a proof that you mm. can do what you do. You know, un, until you get something like that, it's basically your word against everybody else's that, yeah, I can do makeup. And they go, yeah, you can. <laughs> and then they go, no, she can really do makeup because she's got this gold, gold statue. So um, it's good for that. I didn't quite believe it uh, the first time I went. I've been there a couple of times to the Emmys and the first time... Um, I was just I was excited about going obviously but it didn't dawn on me until I was sitting in the auditorium and seeing the huge scale of it and seeing famous people pass left right and center and the whole red carpet thing and you know it, it is awesome um mm -hmm. the governor's ball afterwards uh you know and people you have the statue in your hand if you've won and people are coming past you and going well done and you're going thanks very much i have no idea who you are <laughs> so and um did you, did you did you sense how proud people here were of you when you came back uh well just the people that you work with you know um because game of thrones is, is uh how, because everybody knows somebody here northern ireland is so small i can guarantee you everybody knows someone whose sister worked on it or their uncle worked on it or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, I'd say if I worked on a Bond movie, I probably would have got more feedback from, from, right. uh, from it. But I think because the amount of people here that know somebody that works on it, you're just another But the person. problem, you missed a trick. You didn't do enough smoky eyes on it. I didn't do it. Well, I did for you the If you were smoky eyes, people here would have appreciated you. But the thing, did it change your life? No. <laughs> no. 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 I don't think anything. Game of Thrones does. hasn't changed hasn't changed your life. It's not been it's no. not been something you know, you think you think you would have done brilliant stuff anyway. This wasn't this was yeah, just no. Yeah. no I, I mean the I actually last year I did a, a job last year and there was a few people it was a, it wasn't here it was away and a few people were like oh she did Game of Thrones I bet you she thinks she's great and mm. I'd be thinking you know I'm just this is a new job to me and a new a, a new script and a new story and I'm just as involved in the new one as I was in that one so mm -hmm. You know, that took up, it, I'm very proud to have worked on it and it took up 10 years of my life and I loved every minute of it. And it was a bittersweet ending. You know, I was I was really sad to see it end, but I was mm. also really glad to be able to then do other creative things. So, you know, when somebody rings me tomorrow and says, will you come and do another job? I'm I'm just as excited about that. And mm. What gig would you them. like? What, what, would be the one, what, what would be the gig that you think, I'd love to do that. What what job would you like? Um, do you know, I'm not, I'm not 100% because I kind of think I'm a great believer in uh, fate. So mm. I, I, it has never failed me. Someone will ring me next week and say, do you want to do this job? And if it sounds SH1T, I'll say no. And if it sounds great, it will be great. So mm. I... I, I kind of go along with that I don't I've never had an ambition from uh from all those you know 30 years ago or whatever Paul as I said to you at the time that that belief of what we're doing now is great fun and long may it last I still think that today mm. you know I'm, I'm still thinking somebody's going to ring me up and there's going to be this amazing job I'm going to have a great time and I've been really fortunate that that's what's happened. I'm still looking forward to that. I don't. I don't look forward to working with anyone specifically or any. Oh no! Tell a lie. The genre. I haven't done a, a western. Oh right, well. I'd love to do a western. I'd love to do uh, cowboys and spitting patoons and all that. So it's they the don't only really genre. Make a lot of them anymore. Maybe that's something you <laughs> no. do. No. Well, you can maybe go off and do in the south of Spain or... The thing about these things, Pamela, is that when you get into a really great conversation, 
you miss out on so many of the other things you want to talk about. And I, I, one of the things I'm, I'm a big fan of yours is your ability to project manage, and we're not going to get the time to talk about it because we're running out of time. But the thing that I've always noticed, and this is why you're brilliant at what you do, because you're so good at actually putting projects together and making them work. You see things from A to Z, and you never back down, whether it's putting your school together, building houses, putting teams together. And I think that's what, what gives you the edge as well as being brilliant at your job. Where do you get that from? Is that from your family or your family just brilliant at organization? I, I actually think there's a, I, there's, there's a bit of Asperger's in there, <laughs> without a doubt. I, I have, there must be, whether you call it an issue or not an issue or whatever, but the, the way that my brain works in little, um, little compartmentalization type scheduling, um, there, there, that's the way my brain works. I, it doesn't run in the family per se. Uh, my mum is a bit like that. My son's a bit like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say that that that's that's just who. That's a characteristic of my brain. I don't know whether I I, I kind of think it comes naturally. It's not something that I think about. I don't and just work on it. Lex, your son is now. An assistant hairdresser in our salon. I hope so. <laughs> well, I hope is. he's doing it. No, but I mean, I hope he'll he'll do you proud. Um, I couldn't ask for a better role model, and I I can't actually believe that. Uh, I I now have a son that is, uh, in the position of um choosing a career, and the fact that he's interested in hair, uh, as opposed. I mean, I've shown him lots of other doors. And uh, this is the door that he's choosing to go uh, through at the moment. So yeah. I, I'm wishing him all the best, and hopefully he'll he will gather in my footsteps. He'd be a different person altogether. Um, he, he he doesn't work the same way as me. Um, but he's he's very charming, and you you know you've had him in I, the the I, I like your. He's not too hard to look at. The the old ladies like no, him. No, no. That'll be Mark, not me. <laughs> Pamela, we're finished. That's us. It's um, been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I told you we wouldn't have enough time. Um, we've run out of time so quickly. We could have spoken all night. Thank you for being on the virtual chair. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in reality sometime. Congratulations on everything you've done in your life. And we love you, dear. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.